Hi. Hi. So to anyone watching, welcome to Mills and Boone's Friday Night Drinks, which is slightly different this week because there's a time difference, <laughs> quite a big time difference. So even though it's Friday Night Drinks for us, it's actually uh, morning coffee for Susan. It's um, true. I filled my, uh, although this is water, <laughs> not a clear adult beverage, just water, because later I will be working. <laughs> <laughs> Surely you need a coffee then. <laughs> I have a firm rule about alcohol and work. They must never touch. I don't know how those writers did it. It's like, no, that will never happen. No, that's, 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 a, good, uh, that's a good rule to have. Well, and as you're my editor, I'm sure it's a rule you appreciate. Yeah, I, would, uh, I would like to <laughs> endorse them. Yes, I think we'll stick with that one. Yes, um, let's, we'll keep them very separate. It's a post-work it, event, not it's a, a job post-work and publication celebration events only. Um, so tonight, obviously, Susan Mallory, international best-selling author and author of some of my absolute favorite romances, Mills and Boone, love, absolutely love publishing you. Um, but tonight we're talking about two. One, it is a reissue, uh, Chasing Perfect, which has actually been out for 10, 11 years now. But I think so, years. yes. This year um, at Mills and Boone, we rebranded, gave it a brand new look, um, and it came out in paperback in July. And the second one, Almost Perfect, is out next spring in paperback with the new new look. And we're also gonna be talking about The Christmas Wedding Guest, which is your new book that is coming out next week. Now, two very different ones, but with one thing that I thought we'd kick off with um, in common, I'm gonna show you, yes, sorry, here we go. Get it right. The UK version. I love that. Look, and there she is. There she is. <laughs> uh, both of these books have something that I think is very unique to you, Susan. And, and I've seen other writers do it, but I think something that you do so beautifully in your writing is you create these towns. And that was what, as we're talking about both books, I wanted to sort of ask you about first is how how you go about creating these towns. Do you draw a little map first, or do they evolve as you write? I mean, I've got another, my little props, like Blue Peter. Got, this is Fool's Gold Town, a little postcard. This is from, obviously, from your site, and we made little postcards. But it's it's incredibly detailed. It um, is. And then, hold on, I'm stretching out of camera as well. We do have, um, oops, and an ornament. Um, and then this is, whoops, Wishing Tree. And there's a little, the oops, other side planted. It tells you that the stores, the wreath, where everything takes place. Um, when I first started Wishing Tree, it was going to be a trilogy. So three books, that was the plan. Um, write three books and move on. So I, that was all I was gonna do. So I, I created some businesses that we returned to and it, it's dangerous <laughs> when you don't know because the, um, uh, you make, you put barriers and you open doors that had I known it was going to be like 20 something books, I would have gone differently in the town. I would have made some different decisions early on. So it does create a little bit of trouble. Um, but I didn't put a whole lot of effort into the town because it wasn't going to be bigger than three books. I just had fun with it. I put in businesses I wanted like Joe's with Joe's bar. Um, which is J-O, so it's a woman's bar, and um, uh, things like that. It was just fun, and Mayor Marsha was never meant to be what she became, which is this iconic character who appears in every book and either is God or has a very close connection with a local spy agency because she knows everything. Um, so it's... Uh, Fool's goal developed over time. And then um, my assistant Janelle created the map because we really needed to keep track of where things were. Um, and we started doing a Bible, which was the characters, um, locations, walk-on characters. And it grew by the time I was finished, it was, I got an update. Every time I wrote a book, Janelle read it, updated the Bible with information, sent me back note saying here are your inconsistencies based on the bible perhaps if you looked at it um which i did but still mistakes happen 
And um, it by the end, it's, it's like 375 pages now. And it's very detailed on on uh, all the businesses, all the walk-on characters. It's very interesting. I would start like my, I have names, I have go-to names. So a, a kid's friend, Emily, by the time we got to Emily three, Emily one, Emily two, Emily three, I got a little email saying, maybe not Emily, um, maybe a different name. So um, then it became Olivia one, Olivia two, Olivia three. So, that really grew organically and it was fun to every time i sat down to write a full sculpt book it was sort of an exhale moment it's like going home you know where to hang your coat you know where the secret stash of chocolate is you know which stair creaks it was a lot like that for me i knew the businesses i wanted to use i knew the people i wanted to see every time i wrote a new and i usually wrote them in trilogies I would um, look at the previous books and pick one or two characters that I wanted to update. So figure out where they were in their life and then have them interact with the main characters so that we, it was like a town. So that, that just happened. It evolved because the books were successful and I just kept going. Then I, when I went to write Wishing Tree, they're holiday books set in a holiday town. And um, that I knew every, I knew in advance what was gonna happen. I knew I was gonna be writing this series. I knew it was Christmas based. I created the town with all of that in mind. So the map almost came first. We established the traditions first. For example, there's not a town square, there's a town circle instead, and it's called the wreath. So all the businesses go around it. And then we had fun naming them. And I have a, um, an all access group on Facebook where I have readers who were super fans and you just sign up for it, it's no big deal. But we named them together. So a lot of the books, a lot of the businesses in Wishing Tree are named by readers. And then I use their last name in the book um, as a thank you. So that makes it really fun. Um, there's one business I did name Wrap Around the Clock. That was me. Usually I'm not good at that kind of thing. That just came to me. Um, but the rest of the business is Jingle Coffee and all of those came from um, readers. So Wishing Tree is much more well-planned. It's well thought out. I've left a lot of things open so that I'm not fighting against an issue that I created without thinking because I had no idea I was going to keep going. So, um, so that's sort of the difference between them is one sort of evolved in a sprawling way. And one is a planned urban, well, it's not urban, uh, but a planned community. <laughs> I love that because the irony is the first fool's gold charity. She's a, she's a town planner, isn't she? <laughs> he is a town planner. <laughs> yes. And it was funny because a lot of the things I set up in, um, Chasing Perfect end up going nowhere. I had all these big plans. There's a man shortage in the first book and it just goes away. I really wanted to make it a thing, but then it's kind of, it makes the town sad. And I, I felt they were embarrassed and I just, you know, I'm pretty soft hearted. So it was like, I don't want them to feel bad about themselves and you can only do so much with a man shortage. So that fizzles out fairly quickly. Um, and so that never really became a thing. I thought I would do more with city government and realized very quickly, nobody reads a romance because of city government. Nobody, nobody cares about that. Let's write about cowboys and football players and Tour de punk France, doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, no, I mean, I, I absolutely loved it. And I have to say, I love Chasing Perfect. And I, I think I showed you, didn't I? I've got my old my old copy that I got the, the original of the original um but almost perfect which is the second one I think is also one of my favorites I love it I love that she's a writer I think that's it's one of those things it taps in and this is out it's out in ebook already uh, but it's out in paperback next spring um, with Mills and Boone but that's that's also lovely and I think what is so nice about the Fool's Gold books is that you start as a reader you start to sort of know you you know which way the people are going down the street because you read it so much and like I said you if you have the bible and everything flows 
you've created this wonderful town and then your readers go along the journey with you and they'll know exactly. that you turn right here at the town square and you're going to end up at the coffee shop <laughs> and uh, but it's yeah I mean I, I thought it, it's such it's such a lovely sort of story um, and I loved actually what you you just touched on which I was going to sort of ask about was you do have this wonderful relationship with your readers um, and you just mentioned about your Facebook group where they help and they sort of name and sort of give you ideas. Could you, I mean, I've, I've never come across this before in all the years I've been publishing and I just think it's such a lovely sort of author reader relationship. And uh, could you just, for people obviously in the UK who don't, who might not be on your Facebook group yet, I presume you, you're possibly going to get lots of UK ideas coming your way now. <laughs> I'm, I'm open to that. Um, we love you guys. And uh, it's interesting that um, it sort of evolved with social media. Um, writing is very solitary. And um, for me, the social media is a place to go, especially Facebook, um, because there is interaction. I can ask a question. I will. I have a book coming out in, um, it's coming out in the States around March. Uh, it's called The Summer Getaway. And I'm not sure when it's coming out there, but there is a man in it who was in the army his whole career. And he's he was a drill sergeant for two years. I thought he was just a drill sergeant, but then a reader and I had a conversation who, and she had been a drill sergeant. She's like, no, you can do it for two years. You can't. And then she told me what a day was like. It's like, oh my God, you can't do that for a career. So I get a lot of information um, from people. They, their direct access. Um, I had a book out this past summer called the stepsisters and Daisy was supposed to be, um, a doctor, a respiratory dealing with respiratory and I'm sorry, anesthesia. And it turns out the doctors, it's different. It's the nurse anesthesias who are the one anesthetists are the ones you're seeing there who do the things they do. The ones I'm always, if I have to have something being like, I am still awake. I want everyone in this room to be completely clear that I am still awake. So let's not do anything until I'm not awake to which they usually say, we haven't done anything yet. It's like, as long as we're all clear, I am fully functional. There we are. So, um, but talking to her, I may, I made changes on a book. So readers are influential in that way. They will also ask me to do things. And a lot of times I'm just like, okay, no. But for example, when I wrote, um, when chasing perfect, uh, I had a series out before the Fool's Gold book. Um, and it was, it was the Titans of Texas is what I called it, but it was called something else. And um, this is where we miss my beautiful assistant, Janelle, because she would just type up the name of it. and But she's not, she's not here today. Um, she is still with us. She's just not here today. Anyway, um, a reader wrote and said, I'd had this teenager in a previous series. His name was Raul. And was he going to be in this new series I was writing? Because he's he's grown up. He could be a great hero. And I read the email and I thought, oh, my God. Yes, Raul is going to be a great hero. And I should have put him in something. And I didn't. And I wrote her back and said, you know, thank you. You're way smarter than me because I never thought of that. But he is going to grow up and be a great guy. So he is the third hero in the full gold book, it's um, Finding Perfect. It, he is Pia's hero. And it all came about because the reader said, Raul needs his own book. And it's like, yes, yes, he does. And now he gets one. And then it was interesting to go back and to the book he was in, which was called Sweet Talk, and read who he was and what his life was and what he became. And then how do I integrate that? And then I brought in some of those characters to do a little crossover from it was uh, from a series called the bakery sister so um readers have done that for me i wrote an entire book based on a reader suggestion um a book called the friendship list and uh, i got a reader yeah the a reader suggestion saying you should write about empty nesters and i thought oh sweetie that's never going to oh my gosh you have it look at you wow <laughs> we did not plan this um <laughs> You're really good. Uh, and a reader said, would you write about empty nesters? And it's like, oh, I just, you know, they're going to be old and I don't want to. 
And my email was much more gracious than that, but that was sort of the message. And then I went into my kitchen and started cooking dinner, which usually starts with chopping onions, which is where I always get my ideas and I'm cutting up the onion. I'm thinking, what if it wasn't a couple? What if it was just a woman? And you know, if she got pregnant really young, she wouldn't be old. So I ended up with Ellen who got pregnant at 16. So she's 34 and her kid's going to be a senior in high school and she's going to be an empty nester. And it is, I think by far the funniest book I've ever written. And I can write a pretty funny book. Um, I had such a good time with that book and it came about because the reader, well, obviously I did not satisfy her needs. I hope she understands and is comfortable with the way her idea evolved. But yes, an entire book based on one question from a reader. And I'm like, okay. That's, that's fantastic. And I just have to say, I've just seen Janelle is here, I think. She's just <laughs> sent a little message on the chat. So hi, Janelle. Okay, well, that might've been her texting me. Oh, it was Janelle. Oh, I love you so much. Lone Star Sisters. <laughs> the Titans of Time. I can remember Lone Star Sisters. Hi, sweetie. I didn't know you were going to be here. It's. I don't see you, but it's good to see you. Yeah. And hello. Yes, Janelle. Lone Star Sisters. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> awesome. That's. I mean, I. I do. I love that. And it's also as well as. Um, <laughs> She's waving. She's waving. Um, as as well as readers. The other thing, and we'll sort of move on to to wishing tree. But what I, I loved as well is in there's little tiny sort of spot checks um, amongst your books, like in Wishing Tree, the wine comes from the vineyard. At oh, Painted Moon, yeah. You know. Yeah, just to really show you, look. <laughs> the vineyard at Painted Moon. Yes, I'd like to do things. There are things that go, um, yes, little Easter eggs that appear or that make me happy. Um, make me chuckle. So I will do things like that. I pull in, there's stuff all the time that readers, you'd have to be a pretty um, intense reader to catch all the stuff that goes in. But I do try to do the little crossovers. I'm writing another book and I just, I put in um, Painted Moon wine. I will probably do that for the rest of my career now that I have my own winery. I was going to say, well, now you've got your own sort of Chardonnay. You don't I really do. <laughs> so I can, I can do that sort of thing. And, and so, yeah, it is very fun to be able to go back or to talk about things. Or um, there was a book called uh, Sisters by Choice. And there was a guy in that. Uh, he was a little bit more than a walk-on, but a very small secondary character named Bruno, very wealthy, he had his own private jet. And so I was, I was quite entranced and I really wanted to do something with him and I just let it sit. And then when I went to write Painted Moon and she needs a business partner, it's like, oh, I know this really rich guy, <laughs> it could be him. So Bruno makes the jump to um, the vineyard at Painted Moon. And a million years ago, I wrote, um, I used to write the category books and I wrote a book, I think it's called Living on the Edge, I'm not sure, but there was a secondary character named Angel and he had somebody that slit his throat um, and there was a scar and he, he was kind of scary, just he had cold gray eyes and you know, he could just kill you just like, and, that, and then go get coffee. Um, and so I wanted to do something with him and I kept every three or four books, I would sort of like hold up the heroine and hold up Angel and be like, maybe? And it was always, um, no, he terrifies me. And so in Fool's Gold, I really wanted to make Angel a part of the series. And I knew I was doing this bodyguard school and he seemed perfect for it, but I couldn't find the woman until I met Taryn who was like, yeah, you don't scare me. And she was able to go toe to toe with him in a completely non-lethal way. Um, but it took, it took like eight years till I was able to match him with somebody. So oh, that, that's wonderful. And that's, that's, that's quite romantic in itself. <laughs> well, just, yeah, you know, waiting for somebody to be strong enough for Angel. And I really was sort of like, I would test these various um, heroines, you know, we all have a meeting and they're like, nobody's sleeping with this guy. No, 
no. I mean, if you want to, you go ahead, but I'm not. It's like, okay, no, no, this is not about me. So um, yeah, it was just not working until I met Taryn and it's like, okay, okay. And she's a power dresser. She was the most fun character because I spent all my day on like the Neiman Marcus website, looking up designer shoes and handbags and clothes. It's like, yes, I will be buying that $12,000 suit. Yes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm wearing a shirt from QVC. So, um, wasn't exactly, but it made fun because, you know, when you go shopping, then all your ads on your email and Facebook are based on what you just looked at. So for months, I had beautiful things showing up in my in my ads um, because I was looking. So whenever it starts to get boring, I go look at designer shoes. And then for the next month, they'll just show back up. And it's like, oh, that's so pretty. I love that. That's such, a good, that's such a good idea. Uh, if you're getting stuff you don't like, go look at something like handbag, whatever your thing is. Mm, yeah. If you okay. want to see dogs, go, go look at puppies. But um, I do a lot of, yeah, designer shoes, handbags, wedding gowns, and then you'll get tons of wedding gowns. When I was um, um, looking, when I, I've done, you know, like the Christmas wedding guests and stuff, mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of wedding stuff. So looking up wedding stuff and then you get it back and it's so much nicer than, you know, the knife sharpener you actually bought. Yes. <laughs> well, so one thing I think sort of talking about wishing tree and the well, wish tree, the Christmas wedding guest. And I think we said before, and I know everyone in the Mills and Boone team would never forgive me if I didn't bring up possibly the heroine of the Christmas wedding guest, who is, who is on the cover. And just here, this is Belle. And please tell everyone about Belle. Belle I love Belle. <laughs> I love Belle too. Belle is amazing. Um, and what I would just like to thank you and the team, because when we saw the first cover, it was, I don't think they'd read the book yet. I don't know that you had it, um, but it was a little tiny dog. It's like, Belle's a great Dane. And now Belle's a great Dane on the cover. So thank you. Um, I know to the readers, it seems like that's a no brainer, but trust me as an author, it's so nice when the publisher listens. So thank you for, you always listen when we have suggestions. Um, I was I was brainstorming the beginning of the book, um, coming up with concepts. I love a Christmas story. I wanted, I knew I wanted pets in it. And so I asked readers on Facebook, show me your dogs. And um, I, Janelle actually put together a collection and she knows the dogs I've already written. So it's usually unusual. And I wanted a bigger dog. It's cold. Um, and I thought a, a big dog would be fun in the cold. It turns out Belle is not into the cold, nor is she athletic. <laughs> um, but um, I saw this picture of this great Dane and I'm like, and it is a connection. I will usually look, I'll just be flipping through the pictures and it's just like, boom, that one. And I said, okay, Belle. And that was her name. And so then we ask the reader if it's okay. And then they send me more pictures and a description. And the real Belle is um, quite brave and um, very intrepid. And I had to write back and say, yeah, we're not going to do that. Are you still okay with it? Because it's their pet. I don't want them to feel bad. So we discussed sort of Belle was going to have this interesting character arc where she learns to be, she comes into herself. She, she becomes the belle she was meant to be. So she is, uh, There's there are two heroines in the book, two sisters, Reggie and Dina, and Belle is Reggie's dog. And um, she's a sweetie, but she is not brave. And she's afraid of a lot of things. And um, including her, Reggie's parents have a little dachshund named Bert. And he torments her. No, and I know. Terrified of him. <laughs> and so she does not like visiting her grandpa and grandma because Bert is there. And it's just all a lot of work. So Reggie loads the car with hundreds of pounds of dog food and dog beds. And Belle has her own suitcase of clothing because she's a great day and they don't really have much hair. They don't get a winter coat. And this is the mountains of Washington state. So it's, we're deep in snow. Um, although kind of not in wishing tree for a while, which is the whole thing in the story. So yes, Belle 
evolved and she just no pun intended got bigger and bigger as the story progressed and um is a very significant part of um of the book so bell is there and i have turned in the next year's book which is called home sweet christmas and bell makes a a couple of little walk on we get to see her again she is doing quite well she's very happy she is she's wonderful and when and when the book publishes we are and uh, i'm we're going to be asking people for their favorite bell moment so get reading oh. i want to know because i have a favorite bell moment and as i told you earlier and i just think there are so many wonderful moments for for a great dane um, i think she's perfect and i think she's going to she is going to be sort of the heroine of this of the story i agree and i love that bell's a rule follower it's like we walk on the path Yes, yeah, she walks on the path. <laughs> she walks on the path and there's a little boy who tries to cut across and she outweighs him. Like she probably weighs more than double what he does. So she just kind of looks at him and says, we walk on the path. And so they walk on the path because he doesn't actually have a choice. So yeah, Belle is, Belle is a sweetie. She's a sweetie. And her mom has been so great with us. And uh, as I said, pictures, I still because I have a file with pictures in it. And it's funny when I open it, the first picture that pops up is Belle. And so I'd always like, oh, I love you, Belle. And then I go look find, look for what I'm, or find what I'm looking for. So, um, but yeah, she's always right there. Oh, that's good. Well, in, like you said, with Wishing Tree, it's set in Christmas. Belle has clothes, it's, it's cold. Um, there is an, a great sort of little story about the snow, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, what I I notice, and obviously, um, you know, I think they're great. You with happily this Christmas, you're you know, you've got loads of Christmas stories. You always manage to get these fantastic sort of traditions and moments, and really capture you really capture Christmas and that festive spirit in in your books. You don't just have it be December and snowing. There there's so many lovely little tiny elements that I think make your books just like this perfect Christmas it's like a hug a hug and hot chocolate and marshmallows and and that's I just do you have all these traditions or do you have many traditions yourself or do you do not we really don't which is funny um so what I like to do is what I imagine life in a small Christmas town would be like that well I do love an advent calendar in my life and um I just, I think they're fun. And I always wanted one growing up and it was never, we never had one. Um, and so as an, and now there's like everything, at, there's a cheese advent calendar I heard about. I've tried to find it, Target had it, but it can't, and they won't ship it cause you know, it's cheese. But it's like, I could really get behind a cheese advent calendar even if I did have to store it in the refrigerator. Um, so I love doing in, the, in Wishing Tree, it's a town advent. So on the 1st of December, it's a big thing and it's a group activity. So um, it's something the whole town does together. And then next year in Home Sweet Christmas, it's, it's as significant for a completely different reason. Um, so I like creating these traditions. I think some of them are just way too labor intensive um, in the real world. There are people who want to do that. It would just make me crazy. I'd rather go write another chapter if that's okay with everyone. So I have some, I do the baking, we decorate, not a whole lot. We've got three relatively active pets who can be destructive. So that is a limiter. Um, I try to avoid glitter because nobody wants to pick up poop with glitter in it. Um, so, you know, <laughs> this will all be next time when you start to see me towards the end of october because i have a lot of events planned through end of october through the holidays this is going to look amazing but this will be the best decorated part of my house um because at night i close the door and nobody's allowed in so it's safe and um they don't dare touch anything while i'm here so um this will look beautiful but the rest of the house will be it's a little more careful carefully a lot of ceramic because that's pretty safe. We don't put up a tree anymore um, because it's just too expensive at the vet's office. So uh, I'll have one in here and it'll be under literally closed door one the nighttime. You know, when they get evil at night, cats especially, the cats can be quite uh, mischievous. 
Yes, you do. Yeah, it's. Uh, I know we because I've got my, my obviously my my home office because of lockdown, and uh, I'd I actually used the you know take the the opportunity in last year bought a six foot Christmas tree for this room on the basis that it was locked down and therefore I could legitimately now decorate my office even oh, though we have trees all over the rest of the house. <laughs> I decided that this had to be festive too, but um, it's nice. It it's 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 quite sort of inspiring. I mean. You, you write a lot of Christmas stories. Do you like writing Christmas stories in particular? Or is it just that they sort of, it's seasonal and they are they are sort of the great sort of romantic moments? Um, or is it just that you sort of, you, you don't, I know what you're going to say, you don't like writing them, do you? <laughs> no, I do, I do. The thing that um, makes it interesting is it is a very tight time frame. Um, there's no, we always writers joke about this, you know, three weeks later. So you just have this one sentence, casual passage of time. Um, there's none of that in a Christmas book. In fact, Christmas books, I always have a calendar. I buy blank. Um, they're like desk plotter size with blank pages. And I just use them every, I do November and December. Um, and I write everything out, especially in a place like, Fool's Gold, where there were a lot of festivals, or in Wishing Tree, where I have specific events that occur on certain days, and it is up on the website. So Wishing Tree has its own website. Um, so there is no messing around because, because it's it's been established and probably by me. So I it is a very tight calendar, and sometimes there is a challenging aspect to making the events happen in the correct order on the right day. And I will look up the year that the book is going to be published. And that is the calendar upon which it is based. So what day is Christmas? What day is Thanksgiving? Um, all of that kind of stuff has to be defined because for, in the US, Thanksgiving is such a, a huge holiday for us. Um, and so it is a very tight timetable. And there are also certain topics I will not do at Christmas. So I just feel Christmas books need to be happy. And there's a lot of emotion and people have a lot of drama in their lives. And there's a lot of uh, holiday PTSD that we deal with. So I always feel my books need to be an escape place. So whatever happens, if it's bad, it's gonna be funny it's not funny, it's not going to be really bad. Um, and it's just going to be funny and sexy and heartwarming and make you feel really good and want to go eat some fudge. That That is sort of my goal, um, to get you in the mood for the season and to make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. So um, that's what I look at. The hardest part for me is we never get to write them at Christmas. I've written like one Christmas book at the holidays. It's usually April. April, May, and it's just not the time to be writing a Christmas book. So that makes it difficult. And behind me is my, there's a little thing on the, on the edge. It's uh, the Grinch and Cindy Lou and Max, the dog. Oh. And when I wrote um, Home Sweet Christmas and when I wrote the, uh, the Christmas Wedding Guest, I literally had that on my desk. It's, it's small enough to be mobile. Um, I can tuck it away, but it would be like every morning I just plopped it on my desk to like try to <sighs> Christmas rally because it's, you know, it's May. Yeah. yeah. So that part is more complicated, but yeah, I, I like them. I think they're fun. Readers love them. And my joy is pleasing my readers. So there's that. I'm very, very slutty for my readers. So um, I'm happy to do them. They love them. They love them. They, they do, and one one of them has been turned into a Christmas film, hasn't it? Yes, one one is uh, was made. Um, Marry me at Christmas. It was, it made me happy. She has the most amazing coat wardrobe in the world, and fabulous hair. And I secretly have incredibly curly hair. I know, but this is a lot of time and money. Um, super curly hair. If my hair looked like hers, I would wear it curly, but it does not. It is nowhere near that attractive. So I love, yeah, they did a great job with the movie. Although hysterical thing in the movie, his name is, he's a action movie star. And uh, in the book, his name is Johnny Blaze, B-L-A-Z-E. In the movie, 
his name is Johnny Blake because they felt Johnny Blake sounded too much like a porn star, which makes me love Hallmark more that they actually thought about he sounded like a porn star. It's like, I love you guys at Hallmark so much. Big hug, big hug. So yeah, it was great. We watch it every year. We have our stack of movies. We do still do them on DVD because we just do. And that is in the pile. And then it's a rearrange. Well, we actually have a specific, we watch Love Actually the morning of Christmas. Um, and yeah, we just do every. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I'm going to tell anyone in the UK, it is it is on every Christmas. I watched it last Christmas. So I know we do. I do breakfast casserole. We take our coffee and our jammies. Us and all five of us, my husband and the three pets, we pile onto the sofa. And before we have, go do family stuff and, and all that, we sit and we watch Love Actually. Yeah, it's great. It's super. We watch was it Muppets Christmas Carol. The Christmas Eve night is the Muppets. Oh, we have that one too. I love that. Love and that. then I have Scrooge, which is the Albert Finney one, yes, which I love and my husband tolerates. And then, yeah, then it's like, oh, and they're all, all the good ones are British. Um, the Holiday. Oh, yes. I love that one. Jude Law and Kate Winslet. Yes. yes. The Crier. The Crier. Yes. <laughs> and now I want to make, after I saw the movie, it's like, I want all my heroes to cry. But I thought perhaps that was not completely on brand. So, you know, it's funny. I just, I finished a book. I'm so lost. What did I turn in? Yes, it was the last book I turned in. And if Janelle is still here, she will tell me what the title is. It's like the Boardwalk Bookstore. Bookshop. Bookshop. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, Becky, I didn't know you know. Yes. And <laughs> it's a women's fiction. So only uh, the women's point of view. And at one point I realized all three guys have cried. So really? I had to go back and change one of them. And I think Dwayne doesn't cry now, but the other two tear up, oh, awesome. which is great. So here's Janelle. Yes. Boardwalk Bookshop. <laughs> I love her. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I, uh, because what he broke the, he broke the tear seal on that real men can cry. They can. Thanks. To Law. Yeah. Thank yes, absolutely. Oh, it's good. It's good to know that you, uh, that you, we watch the same Christmas films. I think there are staples. It's like Chris, there are things at Christmas, certain films, certain books. Certain oh, dreams. absolutely. And we do, you know, Elf, Home Alone. Yes. Um, yes. It, we start the, the Friday after Thanksgiving and cause that's a nice anchor for us that we've started the season. We, we have a negotiation of the order in which they will be played and which ones we are watching. Um, and which ones we're not watching this season. And uh, I often have to go watch Scrooge by myself. Yeah. And, um, and some are easy, like uh, Charlie Brown Christmas or How the Grinch Stole Christmas, because it's 22 minutes. It's like, no problem. I still we can cry sit. though, every time. I cannot watch Charlie Brown's Christmas without crying. Really, the tree, is it the tree? <laughs> yeah, the sad little tree. Oh, and Snoopy with his he wins with all those decorations. How dare, I mean, we love Snoopy, but that was not his, was not showing his best side when he was so commercial with his. Yes, absolutely. You know. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's, that's really nice. Um, I wanted, one thing I wanted to ask, which isn't specifically about your books, but I'm sure lots of people will be really interested. Um, and it sort of ties into things that, that we're doing at Mills and Boone and at the moment, we're doing a real push to try and really encourage new authors, new voices um, to, to have the confidence and the courage to, to write and to submit to us and, you know, not be afraid of sort of rejection, the first rejection or work to do. And it, I, you know, I, I can imagine it's really daunting. And so I did sort of uh, briefly want to sort of ask you about sort of your journey to becoming you know, international best-selling author, you know, you, you, it, it, uh, you know, it, you're so successful. And I just think that sometimes it's really nice for people to hear how you got to the point that you did. Um, well, Mills and Boone, oddly enough, plays a part in my journey. Um, I started writing in college. I'd always been a reader. I actually don't remember not knowing how to read huge reader every Saturday morning while my mom slept in, my dad would take me to the library. And the rule was, I could check out as many books as I could carry. 
And after watching me stumble around, one of the librarians was like, sweetie, get a tote bag. It's like, oh my God, tote bag. Um, changed my life because I could fill a tote bag, put on my shoulder and then still have an armful of books, which I would have read by the following Saturday. Um, but it never occurred to me I could be a writer because, you know, writers are fancy and they speak French and live in exotic places. And I lived in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. Um, and so I went to college and I was studying to be an accountant. And um, I was, I read Romance was my favorite. I was a member of the book club. Every month the books came to my house um, and I read them. It's like they only send you six and it's an entire month. Now what? But then the library. Um, so I ended up taking a writing class on how to write a romance novel. And it was a revelation for me because my instructor was like a regular person. And actually when I think about it now, she was a percussionist for the LA Philharmonic. So perhaps not as ordinary as, but I didn't pay any attention to that. It was like, she was a real person. She had an extra group. I went to her house, I petted her dog. I used her bathroom. It's like, she was regular and she was selling. And she sold to what was then Harlequin Temptation. During my first class, she sold her seventh book. And I remember sitting in class thinking, if I could sell seven books, that would be all the books in the world and I would be happy forever, which turned out to not be true. After seven books, I could still want things, but um, I worked really hard. I was young, I was going to college and my brain was a sponge and I lived in LA. So I, I just started studying. I took all the classes I could take. Uh, UCLA as a writer's extension, the Screenwriters Guild offers classes to non-members. I never wanted to write a screenplay um, but you could study story structure, um, because there's usually things you're good at and things you're not. And it does not take that long to figure out. I was great at characterization and dialogue and emotion, and I did not plot at all. I didn't get it. It was, I just, it was nothing I knew how to do. So I, um, I studied screenwriting, a lot of it. And in fact, to this day, when I plot a book, um, it is a three act story structure based on screenwriting. And if you take this book and if you're a writer and learning and separated it as two sisters, you can pull the stories apart and each of them has their own structure. They are structured independently. And then there was a third structure that structures them together. So it never went away, the screenwriting. And I started submitting and getting rejected rejected and submitting and submitting and submitting. I sold really quickly. I sold in about 18 months, but by the time I sold, I had 50 five Oh rejections from all over because I was very prolific. And on a humorous note, just brace yourself, Becky. I don't know if you know the story, my favorite, favorite, favorite line in the world, hands down was Harlequin presents. And I sent to them endlessly. I love them. And this, this was a while ago. And the, the, it was very alpha male, which I don't do. I do not do the, these were like serious alpha males. And um, I just kept submitting. And it was mostly query letters because you had to send a query letter because they didn't have an agent. Then they would ask for three chapters. I couldn't could not get it. And finally I got a letter saying, we are never going to publish you. Stop <laughs> submitting. Oh my and I'm like, okay. It was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because I loved them. And so um, I looked around and tried to figure out where to submit to in the U S and I really liked desire. Um, but they seemed shorter and I wanted to tell a little bit longer story. I couldn't submit to temptation because my writing teacher wrote there and it's like, you know, that's like dating her husband. No, I cannot do that. So I submitted to special edition and that's where I ended up selling was special edition. Um, and I tried a couple more times at presents and they're like, I'm sorry, what part of no was unclear to you. Oh. And um, so I wrote for special edition. I did end up, I wrote a few. There used to be a suspense line called Intimate Moments. I wrote a handful for them. I am not 
a suspense author. I just actually read all three of them to see if they could be fluffed and reissued. Um, and no, not really. If you want to go read them in ebook, just be gentle because I was young and just be nice. Um, it's all I ask. Actually, I, I was pleased with Surrender and Silk, except I felt her inability to shop was perhaps overdrawn, um, which would make sense if you read the book. Anyway, but I settled into special edition. I learned so much writing there. I People say category holds you in and because there's limitations, which is probably true for some people. But for me, the structure of it, the page length, the um, the the subject matter, the the uh, drive of the line, the, the theme of the line was really helpful because within that structure, I could do anything and I did do anything. I experimented. Um, I have an entire series of chic books set in fake countries um, that were fabulous to write. They were, they're my homage to presents. And I had trouble titling them because there'd be like, it sounds like a Harlequin Presents title. It's like, yes, I know, isn't it amazing? <laughs> um, I got close. I did get, I think I got the disobedient, the Sheik and the Disobedient Mistress, but it was like a big fight. I mean, I had to call in it cost me to get a couple of my titles through, but um, those were just those were just glorious indulgences, and I still love them. Um, so I loved writing it. So that was my start, and then at this when I okay back and this is so long. I'm so wordy. Back back back. This is why I have editors that are so good. Um, when I first sold, my actual first sale was a single title Western romance, like set in the Old West to uh, Berkeley and not under a name you know and don't read it because um, it's really awful. Um, and so I was doing both. I was writing category and I was writing these single title historicals. And it turns out there's a reason that Mills and Boone and Harlequin exist because people go buy your book. So I did really well with my category romances. According to the royalty statement from my first couple of historicals, three people and my mother purchased the book and no one else. Because in, in the category world, you'll take a chance on a new writer because you like that line. You like what they're doing. Um, but when was the last time you picked up a book by somebody you've never heard of without a recommendation? It just doesn't happen very much. So by the time I started the crossover to writing, you know, the big books, I had a readership that mostly followed me because I have amazing readers um, and I was able to build on that. So the short answer is I had 50 rejections in 18 months before I sold. So the people who are successful are the ones who don't give up. There are, I know, dozens of writers that are light years beyond me in talent just amazing gifted writers who will never publish because they will never finish a book or never sell or submit or self publish, um, but to do something. Um, and so that is, um, I'm sorry, it was just Janelle saying she has to go and we will miss her. The world is a little less bright now. Um, so don't give up. That's my, always my writing advice. It's like, don't give up because if you give up, here's what I can tell you for sure. You will never be successful if you give up. That is a given. It's yeah. the people who make it are the ones who don't stop trying. Yes, there are the occasional lightning strikes. But if you look at everybody on the New York Times, less than 5% of them are a lightning strike where your first book hits and you're famous. Almost every one of them. Look at Stephen King. Yeah. He didn't start as a mega bestseller. He started writing short stories and then books and then he grew and that's what happened. So don't give up. That's that. Yeah, that is perfect advice, I think. And, and actually, then we'll talk about Mills and Boone. Yeah. And uh, no, and for, any, for, for the UK, obviously most people know this, but the Harlequin Prince is the Mills and Boone modern line and the special edition, oh. including Susan's titles, are the true love line. As oh, well. okay. Yes. Oh, that's right. It is modern now. Um, but you can definitely get them here. I'm going to look them out. <laughs> It, uh, it's so funny. Yeah, no, that was great. And I remember a few years ago, I came to the UK and um, went to the offices and went to lunch and without thinking, told the story and the look of horror around the table. It's like, oh, my God, you shouldn't have said that. 
<laughs> They're like, we're really sorry. It's like, no, 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 I get it, I get it. Oh, well, we've been chatting for much longer than the half an hour that we, we said to everyone. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. It's always a pleasure talking to you, but it's been really lovely this evening and talking about the Christmas wedding guest, which I'm going to hold up again and get it in my camera shot to you the UK and the US cover. They're so lovely and it's out next week. And oh yeah, it's just a beautiful story. And it's yeah, fun, it's really we'll, fun. We want to hear your favorite Belle moments, don't we? <laughs> I love Belle, Belle's amazing. But, uh, but yes, thank you so much. It's, thank you, uh, Becky, this is great. It's, it's been so much fun. And oh yeah, thank you for sharing everything about Chasing Perfect, Wishing Tree and and yeah, your path to being an author, I think that's going to be really helpful for people. But yeah, so thank you very much. And have You're a lovely, welcome. Have happy holidays. Day. Yes, happy holidays. <laughs>